you were mentioning there about actually about women's and men's brains. And I know a lot of your work um, has very much focus on cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. And in the UK, very, different to the US, because I know cardiovascular disease here, I think is still the leading cause of death. But in the UK, it's dementia, which is one of the forms of cognitive decline. And I know that you speak a lot about that and Alzheimer's. And women are more predisposed to get dementia than men. So that leads to my next question. One, why are women more predisposed to this? And two, what are the things that we can be doing if we're thinking about prevention of cognitive decline as well? Yeah. To answer the first question, why are women more prone to dementia and specifically Alzheimer's disease? Um, like you said, dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's is the main type of dementia, but 60 to 70, well, 70 to 80% actually of all dementias are Alzheimer's disease. So why is it that two thirds of the cases are women? There are multiple theories. We don't have a single answer to clarify the picture. There was a suspicion that um, women, because they live longer, um, they are more prone to showing the symptoms of dementia. But we now know that, you know, even when it's corrected for age, it seems that women have a slightly higher risk. Another theory is that the population of women that we're looking at right now may not have had the same kind of positive lifestyle attributes that could have protected their brain. Men you know, especially the ones that are in their, say, 80s and 90s, 70s to 90s uh, age range. It could have been because they were not exposed to a lot of cognitive and mental stimulation as much as, much as men did. Maybe the pathology is essentially the same thing, but the symptoms manifest more in women compared to, to men. Um, could hormones and could the perimenopausal element of it play a role in it? You know, our friend Lisa Moscone is working on that. Uh, and, you know, we're learning so much more about the impact of menopause and perimenopause on brain health. So there are multiple different hypotheses that we're looking at. Is this going to change with the newer generation now being more involved in the communities, going outside of home, at being more educated, having access to cognitive and social, you know, stimulation? Could that actually change that relationship later on? We don't know. Um, but as far as prevention is concerned, my goodness, there's so much we can do to prevent cognitive decline and diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And that has been the core focus of our work. And when you look at the data from our own research and from you know the research all, all over the world, just now people are accepting the fact that dementia can be prevented. So 10 years ago, we used to go to the, the, all of these conferences and it was a controversial topic. And so I'm really happy that, you know, people are, or and scientists are actually seeing signal. And just to simplify it, there are five pillars of lifestyle that seem to make, uh, that play a major role. I would say six. The five are nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep hygiene, and optimizing social and cognitive activities. And, you know, we created the acronym NEURO, self-serving, because we're neurologists. We say the NEURO plan. N stands for nutrition, E for exercise, U for unwind, R for restorative sleep, and over optimizing cognitive activities. And I think another element is addressing vascular risk factors, especially during midlife. So having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, glucose imbalances like diabetes or prediabetes, um, and making sure that inflammation and oxidative damage is addressed as soon as possible. Those, if, if I had to package all of that, that would be the package, the elements that can prevent cognitive decline and prevent diseases like Alzheimer's. I love that you mentioned that because personally for me, it's very, very close to my heart because my grandmother passed of Alzheimer's after suffering with it for 14 years. And I think probably most people listening to this will have someone in their life that they love that has been touched by, sadly, dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, and I think it's one of the saddest diseases to watch. Um, it kind of feels like a death sentence, not just for the one suffering, but also for the family that is around them because you slowly start losing the soul of that person who you love and you've known. And when they get to that point when they don't recognize you, 
it's increasingly hard for them, for the family or the friends around them as well. And the thing that I've really struggled with is, is, is are they in pain? And how much is that brain understanding really what is going on? You know, you really start seeing, seeing a decline. And I think for so long, you know, it was probably 20 years ago that my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and it felt like a death sentence. You know, it felt that there is nothing that we can do. You know, when my father got diagnosed with cancer, we thought there's things that we could do. And there was things that we could do. When my grandmother got diagnosed with Alzheimer's, we didn't know what to do. And if, and you know, I would think about things now. She walked every day. She would walk minimum 10,000 steps. She belonged to the church, so she had real faith. And, you know, she had the community, so she didn't feel isolated. She baked all of her own food. Um, and she grew all of her vegetables in the garden. So you know, ultimately she was a teacher. So she used to teach. So she always had things where she was improving. And so I would sit there and rack my brains. And then something has come up in the last couple of years that made me think, well, maybe it could be genetic, which I think is quite a small percentage of people that get Alzheimer's. Or maybe she was a sugar addict. And now she actually would always just consume mostly sugar within her diet. Um, and it made me think of the term Alzheimer's 3 that's being thrown around a lot. So can we talk a little bit about this? Because, well, diabetes three, which is linked to Alzheimer's, um, because we've got type one diabetics, which is genetic. We've got type two, which is due to metabolic factors um, that can be reversed through diet and lifestyle. Um, and now we're getting type three diabetes, which is spoken about, which is linked to, to Alzheimer's or, you know, there's a theory there. So can you explain a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the genetic component, we are all genetic beings. Um, everything we do has genetic influence, including our, our behaviors. We know that uh, the, the genetics of our dopamine receptors affect how we behave as, as populations. There's beautiful stories about how population migration was affected by that. So genetics is everywhere. It's the relation between genetics and environment. How much is genetically driven and how much is driven in the interplay between those? Now, there are certain diseases that are 100% penetrant, meaning that if you have the gene, you're going to get the disease. Huntington's disease is that. It's a horrible disease. People get in their 30s, and we quickly check their, uh, their genes to make sure their children don't have it because we know that by the age 30, they're going to get it, and we know how it's going to manifest. But a great majority of other diseases are not 100% penetrant. There's a relationship. For Alzheimer's, only 3 to 5% of Alzheimer's is driven by 100% penetrant genes, closer to 3%. The rest is genetically influenced, but it's the genetics with environment. So and that what are those like epigenetics? Epigenetics, beautiful, yes. And the epigenetics, as well as the data, epidemiological data and population data, show us that there are four main pathways. One of them is glucose, glucose dysregulation, we call it. Not just diabetes, or, but it's actually insulin resistance. Is, is one pathway. The other one is actually a big one, is lipid dysregulation. People with high LDLs, there's plenty of studies that show that people with high LDLs, even when you control for everything else, they have a much higher risk of developing not just dementia in general, but Alzheimer's in particular. Other ones, one is inflammation, chronic inflammation. And the third, fourth one is oxidation. Now, none of these pathways are in, in isolation because if you have um, sugar or glucose dysregulation, you're going to have downstream inflammation as well. You're going to have, you often have lipid dysregulation, but sometimes one of these pathways dominates. So it's not just type three diabetes. That's one of the pathways is glucose dysregulation, but there are others as well, as well. But the beautiful part of this is, is that if we are aware of this and we, uh, we, we address those both pharmaceutically, we're not against medicine. We're not in the camp that we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Medicines, the reason you're alive to age 70s, part of it is public health. Let's not forget this. We're not, uh, uh, all of a sudden we've become naturalists. Try doing that. In, 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 in That's one why we're not um, dying of infectious diseases anymore, because we've got medicines. So. That's why 90% of you are not dead from dental problems. Yeah. Yes. I mean, people forget. I was, I, I. I created a healthcare system for an entire nation, uh, Afghanistan, some worked in Somalia and WHO. You should see what kills people in, in, in right now in 21st century. So the medicine works. If you need cholesterol lower medicine, um, we don't take a penny from nobody. Uh, that works. If you need diabetes medicine, you, you need to take diabetes medicine. So medicines work. But lifestyle works as well. And lifestyle 
affects those variables, which is glucose dysregulation, lipid dysregulation, inflammation. And, and the secret to that is very simple. And what we've made is we've made everything political. It's not more plants, less processed food. Let's just go there. Uh, uh, carbs are not bad, but simple carbs, processed carbs are bad. That's it. Uh, meat, we don't eat meat, but all meat is not bad. I mean, if you're going to have it as a as an add-on on the side, go for it. If you're going to have fish here and there, go for it. But it, it, it just means knowing the bigger picture. And that matters because we say as much as 80% of dementias, especially Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, can be prevented. And that's important. We can't. What was the percentage? Did you say? So, so we think that we're. This is the extrapolation. As much as eighty percent of dementias can be prevented. The data, the real hard data, and they're not, is sixty percent. But we're saying that if you live optimally with exercise, with great nutrition, with you know stress management and sleep hygiene, as much as eighty percent, and prevention is important. And prevention is not just for preventing dementia, but cognitive decline that happens in general population, which is dependent on glucose dysregulation, which you beautifully uh, stated, as well as all these other lifestyle factors. And we have power. That's that's where we need to start focusing on. I want to add one thing here. And I think this is important because you know, we're having such a lovely conversation and I know that your audience will appreciate this. My issue with calling... Alzheimer's a type 3 diabetes. So first of all, type 3 diabetes is not a medical diagnosis. It essentially was created by a number of uh, scientists who kind of wanted to highlight the importance or the relevance of diabetes in Alzheimer's disease. And Dean and I have published a couple of papers on insulin resistance and diabetes, and clearly there, there is a link. But attributing uh, Alzheimer's to only eating sugar or type 3 diabetes is like saying, and I actually Misleading. made a post about this. Yes, it's it's, it's basically, you know, uh, attributing rain uh, for a car accident that happened. It wasn't just the rain that potentially added to that event. It was probably the driver. It was the tires. It was the car. It was the road. It was lighting. It was so many different things. So glucose dysregulation is one element of multiple things that could lead towards that direction, which is Alzheimer's. I love that you said that because I do think that metabolic disorders are so multifaceted and sometimes we can just demonize glucose and sugar very, very quickly. It's having a very big moment at the moment, um, which, you know, I, I think it's great that we're talking more about things that we can reduce in our diet, like ultra processed foods. But I do think just demonizing one type of thing and attributing that to our science is also very scary. And I do think, yes, we do know that we should be reducing our sugars. Um, but again, as you said, there's, there's so many different pathways um, and actually just trying to increase our plant-based foods or our fibrous foods, you know, these are also amazing other pathways. So if we're thinking about people that are living predominantly on sugar, what else are they predominantly doing? Are they smoking more? Are they doing less exercise? It's similar to this analogy of people who floss their teeth live longer. It's not because they're flossing, it's because they're taking more care in their lifestyle prevention activities, which is kind of the key factor here. And that's how I see the, the analogy. I Absolutely. love that. I, I, anytime people can make it, a, put a little effort on the, on the bigger picture, it's, it's so, so helpful. That's the greatest public health and, and work you can do is, is that. Uh, it's, it feels good to say one thing did it because then I just do that thing. And, but feeling good is not the same thing as doing good. And, yeah. and, and doing good is a little bit more complex picture, looking at a bigger picture, not getting into camps, not listening. We, 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 we gave a talk at ACLM. We were the keynote speakers. And, and the first thing, College of Lifestyle, Lifestyle Medicine. Medicine. And the first thing we said is, please do not make icons of anybody, including us. The, you, you shouldn't value a person, no matter how many degrees. They say, you know, I have more degrees than a thermostat. Doesn't matter. What I should be valued by is the next thing that comes out of my mouth. Is it based on data? And is it supported widely? That's it. So, and if we start doing that, then we don't fall into camps and we go with data. So I love yeah. that and, you brought that. And be comfortable with nuance <clears throat> and complexity and be open to change as you get more data. I think that's the biggest thing. I think most scientists 
respect to scientists, will also will always say, oh, I have more of a reductionist view 15 years ago, and now I actually disagree with my views. And I think that's the beauty of these conversations and the importance for the audience to understand that maybe what we're saying now is what's based on the data and that can change in, in five years' time. And so I think also being intuitive with oneself is also really important. <laughs>